Barbara. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. That's where we're going to be today. It's always a privilege uh, to get to be here and to get to step up. Um, it's, it's, uh, I just find it funny because everyone can always remember Donnie's name. They can always remember Steve's name. They can never remember my name. It's because I only get up and do the announcements. So today I got to do a lot. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to get to share with, with you guys what I believe God wants me to share. And I hope that you're ready to listen to what God might say through his word. And so we're in John chapter 15. Hopefully you've already found it. Stand with me as we read God's word. John chapter 15, starting in verse 1, it says this, I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that, he may, uh, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is it that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. As a father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let's pray together. Father, we lift up the name of Jesus. Father, we know your word is truth. Father, we are sanctified by it. We're set apart for your use. And Father, I know there are many people in, in this room right now that, that are believers. Father, they've repented of sin. They've turned to Christ. And Father, what you want us to do is to bear fruit. But Father, I also know in a room this size, there's people uh, that, that are lost. Some know they're lost and some are uh, not even for certain what they are. Father, we pray that your word will have its perfect work in our life today as we get to hear it. Father, I pray that your thoughts would be found in my mind, that your words would be found in my mouth, and that we might lift up the name of Jesus and point people to the cross today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. For you that just read through uh, that with me, there's two words or two phrases that come up. Anybody want to take a stab at the two things that come up the most? You can just say it out loud. Abide. We heard abide nine times in those 11 verses. All right, and what was the other thing? Bear fruit. That comes up six times just in those 11 verses. And I believe the two go together. I, I, I believe uh, full-heartedly that uh, you can't have one without the other as a believer. And so very quickly, I, I just wanna talk about what it is to abide in Christ and to bear fruit in Christ and for us to be challenged by that. Um, I think it's good for us to understand what those words mean. Uh, sometimes we have different ideas of what, what a word means, or we come up with our own definition. And so th this is the definition we're going to be working off of. So the first one we're going to look at is abide. What does abide mean? Abide means to accept or act in accordance with a rule, law, or decision. And the one thing that's going to transcend what's going to be our law is God's word and the example of Jesus Christ. And so when, when we talk about abiding in, we have to look at what Christ has said and what scripture says we ought to be doing, all right? Uh, what, what it says we ought to be doing. And, and I think there's 10, 10, no, there's not that many, four. I don't know where 10 came from. Uh, four, four specific things that we see in the book of Acts. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts. Okay, you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 20. We're kind of gonna work backwards about this idea of abiding. When he talks about abide in me, how do we abide in Christ? How do we abide in the Father? What does that mean for you and I? Um, whether, whether we're an unbeliever or we're a believer, I, I believe there's things that brought us to that point as believers. And so the first thing is in Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Acts 
Acts 20, 21 says this. It says, testify both to Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God and faith in Christ. I believe the first way we abide is this, we acknowledge Christ as, as Savior and Lord. That, that is the pinnacle, that's the starting point of what it means to abide in Christ. All the other, th- we're gonna talk about three other things very quickly, but it starts there. If you've never rep- repented towards God, I mean, you, you turn and say, I know there's nothing good in me. I know I am full of sin and selfishness and I'm gonna repent, which just means I'm gonna turn away from that and I'm gonna turn to you, God, and I'm gonna recognize you not only as my savior, but my Lord, which is just a fancy word that we call boss, all right? You're gonna be my boss. You're gonna tell me what to do. That's that's what it means to abide in him. Everything else we're gonna talk about, about this idea of abide, stems from that, stems from this idea of acknowledging Christ as Lord Lord and savior. And so you're there in, in Acts, so the first step is this, Have you repented? Have you turned to Christ? Because that's the first step in this idea of abiding in him. As he talks about this uh, through uh, John, as Jesus is getting prepared to give up his life for us, he talks about abide in me, abide in the Father, abide. That means to trust him, to make him boss, to make him Lord, not just our savior that saves us from things, but that directs our life from that point forward. Second thing we see about this idea of abide, it's a continuation. It doesn't just stop there, does it? The Christian life doesn't just stop when we become believers and we repent of sin and we accept Christ as Savior, we acknowledge him. There's other things that he calls us to do. And I think the first step that he calls us to do is found in Acts 10. So flip a little bit further. Acts 10, a little bit further to your left. Acts 10 in verses 47 and 48, Acts 10, 47 and 48, says, can anyone hold water f- from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain there some days. And so I believe the first step for us, after we've acknowledged Christ as Lord and Savior, this idea of abiding, staying close, following his command is to be baptized. Jesus gave us this, that example with his own life. We see throughout the whole early church that they were baptized. By the way, you see here, they've already received the Holy Spirit when they're baptized, right? Does baptism br- bring us salvation? Absolutely not. It's the first step of obedience. And if we're going to abide, if we're going to be obedient to the law, obedient to what Christ has told us, that next step after acknowledging Christ is to be baptized. So for you that are in the room, have you acknowledged Christ? That's the first step of abiding. Number two, have you followed in believer's baptism? Have you followed in believer's baptism? You know that. I, I, I don't know everybody's story. But if you want to be obedient, you want to abide in what Christ has for us, that's the next step. That's the next step of what you need to do. That's the next thing he's called us to do. And we see that example over and over again in the New Testament. This is not something that's just in one portion. It's there over and over again. So acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior. Be baptized. Flip a little bit further. Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the third thing. Acts chapter 2. I know I'm making you work today, right? I don't have it up on the board because I don't make my students do that. I make them flip. I want you guys to get... Get comfortable moving in your Bibles. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And it says at the end of that, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. And Donnie talked about this last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But how did they know a number? Because they joined something. They joined something. They knew who was part of the church. And I believe in abiding to him, those first steps is first off, acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior to be baptized and then join a local church. The awesome thing about how churches work here in America is when you're baptized, you usually become part of it. But joining is so much more than that, isn't it? Joining is finding an active part. All right, for the people to know you are part of them. 
There's a show, and I'm not going to go into it deeply, but for you that know me real well, there's a show I love to watch. I'm not going to name it by name, but I love it, all right? I love it. And there, there's these two characters that in the beginning of the show, uh, there's this joke where, where the guy doesn't, he, he's, he's engaged to the lady, but he doesn't want to fully commit. And it's just this running joke through the first few seasons about how he won't commit and, and how it causes so much turmoil in the bride's life because she doesn't really know where he stands. Yeah, they're engaged, but they've never set a date. They've never gotten married. They've never gone further. And this is what I kind of see with us. Sometimes we're here in the building and we show up on Sunday, but that's about as far as our commitment goes. Now the Lord knows our heart, but guess what? There's a lot more to the bride, isn't there, than just you. Does the other part of the bride, the church, know how committed you are? We should, right? We should know how committed we are. And I believe that's by joining the church, publicly coming forward and saying, I'm in this. I'm with you. We're here together. It's you and me. It's all of us working together. That's how I'm going to abide in Christ, by letting my other, the other people on my team, in, in the bride, know that I'm fully invested in this. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've done step one. You've acknowledged Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe, maybe you've, you've even been baptized, but you've never let the church know that, man, I, I, I'm, I'm fully in. I'm fully in. This is, I'm, I'm with you. I, we're in this together. We're in this fight together. Now, like I said, for, for you that come and you acknowledge Christ for the first time, we, we, put you, we put you on the roll, right? You're part of the church, the church role. But even there, sometimes we can be that standoffish family member, can't we? And we never really get invested in the family. And I, wanted, I want you to know, this is just a side note for a second. God has gifted you through his Holy Spirit to do the work of the ministry. And your giftedness is different than mine, but he has brought all of us together for his purpose. And that's to glorify the name of Christ and to make him known. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Abiding in him, to acknowledge Christ, to be baptized, to join the local church, all right, to join the local church. And I think there's one other there in, in uh, Acts chapter two, going a little bit further back, verse 42 says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and breaking bread and prayer. Can I, can I encourage you? Man, we just heard bro, uh, Brother Bud get up and talk, talk about how there's people across the world that are happy to have a little New Testament that's fallen apart. They don't even know what the Old Testament teaches outside of what they've heard. They can't sit down and read it for us. We are, a, we are so, I'm not gonna get on soapbox, but we have so many. We have so many ways and accesses and avenues into studying scripture and we are illiterate. We are illiterate people. We are easily fooled by false teaching because we don't know it. And we're not abiding in him because we're not in scripture and we're not praying. God, how can I use my spiritual gift? How can I get involved? How can I share the gospel? How can I win my lost friends, my lost enemies, the people I hate the most? How can I bring them to, to Christ? Because I know I shouldn't hate them. Your love abides in me and that love ought to pour out to them. And that comes through reading scripture. Reading scripture. I hope that you're active part in, in Bible study here, but man, it goes so much deeper than that. It goes so much deeper. I, as a teacher, love to sit in a classroom and know that the people I'm teaching have read and are familiar, and I don't have to spoon feed them. That's a blessing as a teacher to get to sit there sometimes and realize we can dive in a little bit deeper. We can talk about what this means because I'm not having to explain the fundamentals. You and I have that privilege every day. We carry around most of us in our pocket, don't we? But what do we, what do we surround our time with? Now I'm, on, now I'm on soapbox, but let's just stay there for a second, all right? What do we surround it with? Social media, inspirational stories. Those are all good for behavior modification for a short time, but what changes a life? The word of God and Jesus Christ. We ought to be abiding in that. That ought to be part of who we are, right? How we long to pray for the people that we interact with and it changes us. This idea of abiding to acknowledge Christ, to be baptized, to join the lo local church and to devote ourselves to scripture and prayer. And, and I believe this, when we do those things, 
What was the other phrase besides abiding? Bear fruit. I believe the byproduct of abiding in Christ, just the few things we talked about, is that we're going to bear fruit. We're going to bear fruit. Let me, let me just tell you once again, I think we understand what bear fruit is, but let's give the definition just for, for sake. Bear fruit is this, to produce fruit according to its kind. To bear fruit, right, to produce fruit according to its kind. Do you know from the foundations of the earth, when God created the, the earth, that he caused things to produce according to its kind? And if we are born again in Christ, there ought to be specific things that are produced in us. Let me just tell you what Genesis is. It, this one actually be up on the board. You don't have to flip there, right? Genesis chapter one, verse 11 and 12. This idea says, and God said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation, planting uh, plants yielding seed and, and true fruit trees bearing fruit in which their seed according to its kind on the earth. And it was so the earth brought forth vegetation Plants yielding seed according to their own kind and trees bearing fruit in which, uh, in which is their seed, each according to their own kind. And God saw that it was good. Don't you know that if we are in Christ and we bear fruit that is according to who Christ is, if we're Christ-like, that God looks at us and he goes, man, that is good. That is good. That's what Christ has redeemed us for. As we abide in him, as we abide in him, we bear fruit. And we're going to talk about what that fruit looks like, and that's what we're going to end with. But I, I want us to look back at our text, okay? Look back at our text. There, I think there's five things that he talks about when we begin to bear fruit, what, do, what happens. When we begin to bear fruit, what happens? What, what does he do to us or what happens in us as we bear fruit? And so the first one is this. It says that he prunes us. Verse 2 talks about that he prunes us. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he just takes away. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. Now, for you that are gardeners, I'm not really one of them, but I understand the idea of pruning, right? Pruning causes it to grow better and it to be a, a more healthy plant. Aren't you glad that God prunes us? That God tells us what we should take away and what we should add? I, I'm, I'm thankful that we have God's word and I don't have to guess. Because what if all of us in the room, we didn't have any direction through scripture and we just had to try to make this up as we went? Wouldn't it be a mess? But thank God through his divine wisdom that he gave to many authors over many time, a scripture that all points back towards Jesus and gives us direction for what it means to bear fruit. Maybe you're in a pruning season right now. Maybe God's trying to show you to cut some things out. Moms and dads, look at me. Just listen. Your kid is not the center of your family. Your kid is not the center of your family. Make the kid the center of your family and you will not bear the fruit that God intended. Make Christ the center of your family. And I guarantee you this, some of the things you got your kids involved in, he'll start pruning away. He will, but the fruit that produces from that will be greater, be greater than what you think you're going to get out of them. For you, man, my job is number one. Maybe he's calling you not to climb up the ladder anymore. Maybe that's his pruning for you. Maybe to take a job that you thought you would never do, but for his glory. Maybe you're going through that season of pruning. You can feel it in your heart. You can feel it in your mind. It weighs on you. Don't walk away from that pruning. Allow him to prune you. It's for your good. It's for our good. He does that. Why? So we can bear even more fruit. Fruit that is good, that he can look down and go, that is great. That's what I want. So when we begin to bear fruit, he's going to prune us. Number, uh, number two, verse eight, look at verse eight. Verse eight uh, says this. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. When we begin to bear fruit, God is glorified. There's a lot of things that are glorified in our culture, right? But as Christians, what should we do? We ought to lift up the name of Jesus. And as we bear fruit, that's in the, in the likeness of the image of God who has born us again through Christ. It glorifies God. 
So he prunes us. It glorifies God. Look at verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be, cle- may, be, uh, may be in you and that your joy may be full. I believe when we, when, when we begin to bear fruit, when we abide in him and it begins to produce fruit, there's a joy-filled life. There's a joy-filled life. Have you met those people that don't seem to have a whole lot, but man, they love, they love the Lord? And you can't put your finger on why they have so much more joy than you do. It's because of where they're placing their joy. Their joy is not in the things they drive, the things that they have, the positions they hold, or even where their kids are going to be or what they're going to have or what degree they're going to have. It's in who Christ is and what he's done for them. And it's easy to be full of joy when that moment comes. Because the reality is the world we live in isn't always joyful, is it? The realities of sin working in our world isn't. But the realities of Christ working in us and renewing us daily and transforming our mind brings joy. And that's what happens when we begin to bear fruit. Our, our, our life is filled with joy. Number four, section we didn't read, but I want you to look at verse 17. These things I command you, all right, command you, this idea that there's a command behind it so that you may love one another. When we bear fruit, we begin to love others better. When we begin to bear fruit, we understand who we are and that we're nothing apart from Christ, as scripture already said, all right, the branch that's apart from the vine can produce nothing. We realize anything good in us comes from Christ and we begin to love people the way God intended for us. Have you lost your love for people? Church, can I ask you something? None of us like to go to Walmart, but do you see that there's people in Walmart and those people need love? I, I think if we abide in Christ more and we begin to produce fruit, we see them differently. We might still not want to go to Walmart, but we find a purpose while we're there having to stand in line for 30 minutes, right? Or check ourselves out. That's always fun. We can get on a soapbox there, but we won't. All of a sudden, we learn to love people better because of what he's done in us and because that fruit is producing the way he wanted. And the last thing is this. Look at verse 27. This is at the end of the chapter. We didn't read this one either, but it says... And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I believe a a, a life that begins to produce fruit eventually will end with us being a witness. We just can't hold it in, right? I'll I'll give an example, all right? I'm not going to ask your hand, but we got plenty of Sooner and Cowboy fans in the room. You have no problem telling people that you, you love the Sooners, you love the Cowboys, do you? And why is that? Because that's who you are. You have a deep love for them. You follow them. You know their stats. You, you know the history. I think the same thing comes when we begin to abide in Christ. It produces this fruit where we can't, just, we can't help but tell people. It bubbles up inside of us. It's part of our DNA all of a sudden. This new creation in us, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about this goodness that's in us. And we bear witness. And yeah, is it awkward? Absolutely, because nobody wants to talk about death, hell, eternity nobody we all pretend that we're all okay and that's never going to happen but the reality is all of us are worried about that inside and our world needs that they need a witness and you can reach people that i never will and i can reach people that you'll never and us working together we can be the witness god intends and we can bear much fruit because we're abiding in christ so very quickly maybe you're sitting there like trevor what is what is fruit All right, what is it? Glad you asked. Glad you asked. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to end with this. Galatians chapter 5, I think, is one of the best places to go as we talk about fruit because he gives us two two versions. Works of the flesh and fruit of the spirit. He compares what it is to be apart from Christ, all right, that dead branch that's withered and thrown away, and what it's to be made new in Christ. What does it produce? And so we're going to read through this, all right, and they're going to come up on, on the board, and I, I'm going to ask the people at the back, once they all get up, to leave them up there because I want us to look at them. But this is in Galatians chapter 5, starting in, in verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh, that means the natural man, someone apart from Christ, are evident. What are they? 
sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, which by the way, sorcery, you ought to know because Donnie's taught this numerous times, comes from pharmacia, right? Pharmaceuticals is where, where we get that. So drug use, all right? Keep that in mind when you see that word sorcery in your New Testament. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. This is what the life apart from Christ looks like. This is the fruit it bears. We'll just call it bad fruit. We don't need a helper to produce this stuff, do we? This is who we naturally are. Apart from Christ, this is just what happens. This is what happens. But I love that it doesn't end there. Go to verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is this, love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against these things there are no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified to the flesh, the bad fruit. They've died to that and its passions and desires. So I'm going to end with this. Look at those two. What describes your life more? What describes your life more? By the way, this isn't my view on things. This, this is Christ's view. This is the Holy Spirit working in Paul's life to write these things down so that we can take them in today and just think about it. If our life looks like bad fruit, what are we? We're bad fruit. And that goes back to the whole idea of abiding. What do we need to do? We need to acknowledge our sin and selfishness. We need to repent of it. And we need to turn to Christ as our Lord and Savior. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. And I promise you this, it's going to be hard to cut some of that out, but the Holy Spirit's going to work in your life. Over time, through sanctification, God's Holy Spirit working in you, that bad fruit will begin to pass away and he'll produce good fruit in you. And he will continue to do it until this life is over and we're in the presence of Jesus. But I think it's good for all of us to take just a breath to look and evaluate, where am I? Maybe today you were hit hard with the idea of baptism. You've never been baptized. Be baptized. Be baptized. Realize it only comes after you've already acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ and he's already placed his Holy Spirit in you. But it's your first act of, of obedience. Maybe it's this. You haven't joined up with the church or better yet, you haven't told the church that I'm fully committed to this. We're in this together. Then do that. Whatever God leads you to do, but realize this. How do we know if God led us to do it or not? It will stay in accordance to what God has already written. So we judge ourselves by not what we think or how we compare to others, but how we compare to the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for, for your word. We thank you that you work in the life of us. Father, for those that you need to draw to salvation, I pray you'll do it now. For those that need to come and be baptized, Father, present themselves for baptism, I pray that that might happen. For those that need to join up with this church and link up and to publicly make that, this is where I am, this is where I'm going to serve, I pray that that might happen. And Father, I pray for anything else that, Father, they might understand this altar is open for, for them to come and pray. You do your perfect work in each one of our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll join me. We'll sing together in a time of response. 